Okay, thank you. Um, so far, we talk, we talk about fluorescein angiography, and of course, we don't need to talk about optical coherence to tomography, it is there all over the place. Are these two tests adequate for characterization of uh, retinal and uh, choroidal lesions? For diagnosis, for treatment, for follow-up, and for prognostication? Let's see. With fluorescein angiography, the biggest limitation is you can't view through blood. Also, very poor visualization through choroidal pathology, very poor delineation of an occult CNV, and just see a gross leakage, especially RPE detachments. What about OCT? Well, OCT cannot de delineate the vessels anyway, normal or abnormal, and it cannot delineate flow. It cannot delineate areas without perfusion. It cannot delineate any area leaking areas. So what does ICG do, where, uh, which these two can't? Well, the characteristics of ICG are that it absorbs light in 790 to 805 nanometer, and the emission spectrum is from 770 to 880 with a peak at 835 nanometer. The advantage is it can give you an enhanced imaging of the choroidal vasculature, choroidal neovasculation, pigment epithelium detachment. And why is that? Because most of this dye is bound, is protein bound. And 80% of the ICG molecules actually bind to globulins. Now, previously, it was thought to be albumin. And so very little dye escapes from the fenestrated choroidal vasculature. Now, because of this, uh, and because of this, uh, the wavelength, the visualization of dye through overlying melanin and xanthophyll is present, is possible. And it's also possible through serosanguinous fluid, a shallow hemorrhage, or some pigment or x ray, though not completely. So, uh, just like for fluorescein angiography, you talk of hypofluorescence and hyperfluorescence. We've used the term hyposinescence and hypersinescence for ICG, but there is a controversy on this also. So the people say you should call it as hypofluorescence due to ICG, though uh, probably uh, semantically the best term would be hyposinescence and hypersinescence. Hyposinescence is when there is a relative block of, of the fluorescence, either by pigment, blood, serous, fluid, exudate, or because of impaired perfusion, or because of a block of uh, blood flow. So all these things will cause hypersinescence. Hypersinescence, why you get hypersinescence? When there is a lack of overlying tissue, that's called RPE dropouts or lacquer tra tracks, you can have, so this is important to remember. People think that there's no such thing as a window defect in, uh, as far as uh, ICG is concerned. That's not true. Also leakage from retinal pigment uh, uh, retinal and choroidal vessels with staining of the surrounding tissue or leakage from an abnormal tissue or abnormal vessel, like a hot spot or, or a plaque that happens, CNVM or polyps. So just to show you what does uh, hyposinescence look like. The, on this side, on one side, you have the uh, fluorescein angiogram and below you have an infrared photograph. I couldn't get a color photograph of this patient just to show you the large amount of subretinal bleed and you can see through this subretinal bleed also, you can see you, the, uh, the, the underlying hyposinescence, and you can see this hypersinescence area here, and you can have a reasonably good picture of the, of the uh, um, underlying vasculature also, uh, choroidal vasculature also. What about the other eye? The other eye, you can see there's an RP detachment on the, uh, on the FA, and if you see the ICG, you can see the area of the um, RP detachment again shows um, an hyposinescence. And within this, you can see over here, there is a plaque line kind of lesion, which is hypersinescent. Now, what all do we use ICG for? Well, most often nowadays it's being used for PCV. Also for documenting an occult CNVMs, sometimes you can pick up the CNV. Uh, it, it's also not now, but previously used to be used to identify feeder vessels for a neovascular AMD. It's good for, for diagnosis of choroidal tumors. Also being used for study of uh, chronic central serous chorioretinopathy. And of course, uh, Vaishali's favorite topic of posterior uveitis. Virtually all the conditions you can name, um, ICG would have a role there. 
So if it's such a great investigation, why didn't it become popular? The fact is it didn't become popular because of the lack of technology, which was sufficiently sensitive to capture good quality images and the exorbitant cost of technology when it actually became available. You see the, the funders based cameras give you this kind of image. The SLO based cameras give you this kind of image on with such a clear details of the choroidal vasculature. So obviously if you, uh, these are very expensive and without them, you don't feel uh, very good about doing an ICG. Now in uh, ARMD, you need it basically for occult CNVMs and also in the, that form of uh, occult CNVM, the PCV, which is now becoming very popular, very commonly diagnosed. So look at this. This was a fibrovascular PED, and the, you could see the uh, PED on the uh, on the OCT. And when you do the uh, ICG, this is a combined ICG OCT uh, and FA. You can see that in the late phase, there's been a, there's a plaque found. Incidentally, it happens in the late phase, late uh, phase because the leakage actually starts happening only. Uh, around the uh, CNVM uh, in the late phase. And that's when the contrast becomes better. Now, ICG may help you to detect a well-defined CNVM in half the places, uh, patients of occult CNVM. And in some of them, it may turn out to be a subphobia location, which may be amenable to laser. So it's worth doing an ICG for those patients. The second important place is PCV, which today constitutes 20 to 40 percent of cases of occult CNVM. And let's see here how it works. See, clinically, you can make a diagnosis based on the orange reddish nodules in the fundus, the extensive hemorrhage or exudation. But these are only they only give you an idea. What do you see on ICG? You can actually see the clusters or single polyps which are there. They may be pulsatile. So if you do an uh, ICG as a video as ICG. Um, in addition to that, you may even be able to see the branching vascular network, uh, which is another characteristic of PCV. Now let's have a look over here. This was a patient of, with a lot of exudation. Um, the FA only shows a late leakage from an unknown source. The OCT is quite characteristic. This kind of OCT with a peak PED, shallow uh, undulating RPEDs with a double layer sign over here. These are all signs of a PCV. And what do you see over here? Now, when you do the when you do the uh, ICG, you can see the branching. Sorry, you can see the branching vascular network, and you can see uh, one or two small polyps. But when you go to the late phase here, you see there is a plaque lesion here. So you have both the things. You have a diagnosis of PCV, and this has now seems it seems to have gone to the stage of a uh, CNVM formation also, and that's confirmed by an OCT angio. Now, this is another patient where you can see in the you can see the polyps in the early phases. Incidentally, the polyps are seen within the first six minutes, and then you can see they they stand out in the late phase. In that, in the second case, no other uh, lesion is there. But ICG can also be used to assess quiescence of a polyp. Has it become inactive? Has it become resolved? So, which you cannot get in any other way. So now look over here. First of all, you can you can actually characterize the the OCT changes with the IC changes. That where you see the polyp on ICG, do you see it also on the OCT? And you can see this is just to show you that correlation. And then now you look at this. The initial lesion showed these many polyps on the ICG. In the second one, one of these polyps has resolved. Two are still there. So there is partial resolution. And if you follow this up in the, in by 2017, from 15 to 17, polyps had got inactivated, no longer any fluid on, ice, on, on the OCT. But uh, regression was only of one of the polyps. You see this one has the first, I don't know if you can see my pointer. This polyp is no longer there in this second one, 2017. But by 2018, all of them had regressed. Now, in chronic CSR, on the other hand, what you, you what you get, you can if you see the floor scene angiography, also shows you a sick uh, RPE and these multiple areas of leak. You can see this kind of uh, hyperfluorescence in the initial phase uh, before the angiogram was started, and only subretinal fluid with a little bit of RPE changes, and then what do you see when you and you see that this over a period of time. 
Now, when you do the ICG, in the early phase, you see a early hypo sinuses. This is due to late filling. Then you start seeing tortuosity of these vessels over here. You see this? The tortuosity of the vessels in that area and dilatation. And then finally, you have staining of the lesion, which you see over here. Now, this is to show you there are window defects sometimes which are corresponding to the areas which have changes on fluorescein angiography. It's not that you, you the sick RP can cause window defects in the ICG also. So this is another patient where you can see these. And in 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 okay, I will just quickly now. Yeah, so the important thing is. Or, you can have CSR, sometimes the ICG may show a plaque has developed, a CNVM has developed also. So you can find that also on an ICG. The last important thing I want to discuss, just two slides, you see this of a choroidal hemangioma. This patient had filling which increased, you can see it starts in the early phase, increases, increases further and then washes out. This is characteristic of a, uh, of a choroidal hemangioma as opposed to a granuloma. And you can see this only had presented before. This is another patient with the same. And here it looked like a large granuloma, but actually this, this mound combined with this picture, which shows early filling, and then that early filling becomes intense and then it washes out. Whereas on the fluorescein angiography, it just becomes more and more intense. So you can differentiate a choroidal hemangioma from a granuloma. So ladies and gentlemen, ICG improves our diagnostic capabilities in choroidal and retinal disease. Now it's been refurbished and it can help in management of polyparietal choroidal vasculopathy in chronic serous retinopathy and in many inflammatory choroidal inf uh, uh, diseases. So if we use this judiciously along with fluorescein angiography and OCT, we can significantly improve our diagnostic capabilities and understanding of the pathophysiology of these conditions. Thank you very much.